Hi folks and welcome to my talk on Embedded Linux License Compliance for Hackers and Makers. This talk is aimed at individuals and small businesses who are distributing open source software and you may have questions about license compliance, you know, what, what do you need to do, what are the tools that are available, what are the best practices that you should be following. I'm going to talk about distribution. Examples of distribution would be selling a physical product which contains open source software installed on the device. It would also be providing a free download of something like a Linux distro image for an SD card for Raspberry Pi hardware or similar hardware. Basically any action where you're providing someone else with a copy of some open source software would be distribution. So that's, that's kind of a brief intro for the talk. I also want to give you a brief bit of background about me. I've been involved in Open Embedded and the Octo project since around 2013. I work across pretty much the whole embedded stack, kernel, U-boot, um, distributions, everything. Um, I'm currently working as principal engineer at Consulco Group and the company website is consulco.com. Uh, contact details for me if you want to follow up with any questions or feedback at all. You can find me on Twitter, you can send me an email, you can look at my personal website. I've also got a YouTube channel where I upload videos of my talks and um, videos of learning Rust at the minute. So, quick disclaimer before we begin. Um, start off by saying I'm not a lawyer this presentation is not legal advice. Um, what I am going to be talking about is the best practices based on you know, my experience as a developer, my experience as a member of open source communities. So if in doubt, consult an appropriate lawyer. So I want to expand a little bit on my introduction. Um, there's lots of information and tools available for open source license compliance and there's lots of presentations already covering this. So why do we need another presentation here targeted at hobbyists, hackers and makers? I think most of the information that's available isn't really well targeted for these groups. It's not really well targeted for small businesses either. Um, and people generally are distributing these devices containing open source software in small volumes. Um, you know, there's a lot of the tools in, that are advertised for open source license compliance are complex. The methods for using them take a lot of time and effort. There's kind of assumptions that you've got a legal department um, in some of the presentations. And yeah, what I wanted to do is just present things kind of more tailored for this audience of hackers, makers, and small businesses. So why if you're in this group, should you care about license compliance? Well, for, for large corporations, this is often about reducing legal risk of being sued for non-compliance, and it's also to gain influence in relevant open source communities. But maybe not all of that applies for hackers and makers. Maybe you're not as concerned that someone's actually going to take you to court but it's likely that the you know priorities that you're going to have are around empowering users to be able to customize the operation of a device to suit them and being a you know a good citizen of the free software and open source movements um, and the other the other thing as well is when you're building software images actually capturing the source code and the build scripts which as we'll see is kind of part of the requirements to be able to fulfill license compliance. That does really help with reproducibility of builds and helps you debug things. Um, so sources do often disappear off of the internet and you don't want to be coming back trying to look at a problem with a version of your image that's 12 months old and suddenly find you can't rebuild it because the sources have disappeared. So those are kind of some of the motivations why, why you might want to go through this process of open source license compliance. So before I go any further I want to take a minute to talk about distribution as it relates to open source software. So there's a couple of modes of distribution that I'm considering here. Um, the first of those is that you might be distributing a physical device 
that's got some sort of open source software installed on it or programmed into it. And if you're disputing this, then for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to assume that the person you're giving this to has got internet access and can access online resources that you provide, as well as what's actually in the box you give them. The other type of distribution we could consider is when you're just providing a software image for download from a website. So this might be um, sort of an SD card image. You could program onto an SD card, put in a single board computer like a Raspberry Pi. And I'm talking about sort of image that's going to be containing kernel, bootloader, root file system, and other components, and not talking about just a single software package here. And it's important when considering this distribution, it really doesn't matter whether there's any price charged to the person who's receiving this. It is distribution, whether it's free or whether there is a price charged. The one case where we can ignore things really is if you're in a small business and you're distributing these images to somebody else within the same organisation as part of the job that you're doing then that's not really considered distribution to a third party and I wouldn't worry about license compliance as much in that case. So when we talk about open source license compliance, what are the actual common license conditions that we need to comply with? Well, we can group licenses into two broad categories. The permissive licenses like BSD license and MIT license. These licenses require you to provide the license text and any copyright notices usually and you could provide these in the file system on the device, you could put them in the documentation you could probably also put these on a website as well. The other broad group is copyleft licenses which require you to provide complete corresponding source code for any binaries that you distribute that are covered by that license now you can publish that source code directly, similar to the way you publish the license text and notices. Um, but some licenses, for example, GPL, allow you to just publish an offer letter saying that you will provide the complete corresponding source code on request. What we're going to talk about today is this kind of publishing the source code directly. So I want to give some general guidelines to follow, and the first of these is you should use a proper embedded Linux build system to produce the software image that you're going to distribute. Again, whether this is an image file that can be downloaded and copied onto an SD card, or whether it's an image that's actually programmed into a device which you're going to distribute. And the sort of build systems I would recommend here are either build root or open embedded slash yoc2 project. These systems have some really excellent tools to help you collect the license text, the notices, and any source code which you would need to archive to be able to perform your license compliance. The important thing here is that you should avoid modifying the software image in a sort of post-build script that runs outside of the embedded Linux build system that you're using and avoid adding additional software during any manufacturing test processes because either of these approaches kind of bypasses the tools that are present in the embedded Linux build system to collect license text and source code. So other things you should avoid, I highly recommend avoiding desktop and server distros because it is very very difficult to collect license text and source code for all the packages which are installed in your device in a way that you can distribute them and in a way that they can actually be rebuilt from source code easily. I'd also say avoid OpenWRT, it is an embedded Linux build system but it doesn't really have any of the tools for license compliance that other embedded Linux build systems have. If you're using containers I strongly recommend avoiding images pulled from Docker Hub and similar container registries because you probably have no idea what the source code is that's been used to generate the binaries that are in those images. And similarly avoid building container images with a Docker file because 
again, there's just no tools to you know look at the output and understand what own source licenses you need to include the text of and what source code you need to collect. For container images, you can build these with own embedded. You probably can with things like Builderit as well. So there are some things that I wouldn't say you need to avoid, but I would say you need to consider and use them carefully. So if you're using pre-compiled toolchains, for example, the ARM pre-built toolchains, you need to make sure that you go and collect the source code for this pre-built toolchain because libraries from the toolchain typically can end up in any software image that you might then distribute. So for example, um, the toolchain may contain glibc, that's covered under a copyleft license, so you need to be able to provide that source code. I also say language specific package managers have some issues, so NPM definitely has some issues. Cargo has less issues, but still be careful with it. Um, they don't really offer easy ways to collect the license text of a package and all of its dependencies. And some of them don't really offer a way of co collecting the correct version of the source code for binaries either. And the last one to be careful with is sort of third party make files in projects that you use. Watch out for make files which download additional content during the build process or make use of online tools during the build. I've seen both of these in the wild and they make reproducibility and license compliance exceptionally difficult. So let's talk about how you can go about publishing some of this information that you need to release in order to achieve open source license compliance. And we'll start with how you would publish license text and copyright notices where these are required by a license. I think the first thing I would suggest is if you can format the text and notices into HTML file or a plain text file and include that in the software image itself, preferably with some way of accessing that through the UI if your device has any sort of user interface, then that would definitely fit the build. An alternative you could do is to actually collect up the license text and the notices into a Git repository. This would let you update this with a new commit every time you release a new version of your software image. And you can take advantage of free repository hosting by companies like GitHub and GitLab so that you don't have to pay for your own web hosting for this information. Um, and if you're provided an image for people to download anyway, then you can just include the link to this repository where all the licensing information is. Alternatively, you could include a bit of paper with the link on it uh, with a physical product, um, but just have a think about how people would access the license information if their internet connection goes down for some reason. The other thing is how would you publish actual source code? And I would recommend putting these online. I would recommend avoiding the option to publish uh, an offer letter saying that you'll provide the sources on request. I'd recommend just straight away going ahead and providing the sources online. Now there's a, a bunch of cheap file hosting services you can use online. Um, Backblaze B2 is one that I'm quite a fan of. And if you also sign up for a free Cloudflare account and use Cloudflare as a front end to Backblaze, then you won't pay any transit costs for anyone downloading data from Backblaze via Cloudflare. You could always also use something like the storage box service that Hetzner in Germany provide, or any other number of inexpensive storage providers. What I would advise is if you can deduplicate archives between releases where possible, it's going to save you a lot of data and a lot of bandwidth. So if, for example, you've got Bash within your software image and you've got 
you know, using the same version of Bash for multiple versions of your software image, there's no reason why you need multiple copies of that Bash source archive. And the final part of publishing the source code is to ensure that any patches which are applied to the software during the build are also included. So watch out for what I, what I call hidden patches here, so things like said scripts or other processes that modify the source code before it is built are essentially the same as patches and you do need to release those scripts as well and ensure that you've got the patch order recorded as well to make sure the patches can actually be applied properly to the source code. And let's talk about providing the build scripts. So yeah, um, to give an example, GPL version 2 says that you need to include the scripts used to control the compilation and installation of your software. And I think the easiest way of doing this is to provide the sources for the entire build system that you're using. So build root or open embedded, um, provide an archive of the version that you're using. If you're using open embedded, provide all the layers that you're adding to the build as well. And also ensure that any local configuration is included if this isn't tracked in some sort of Git repository. So for open embedded, this would be your local.conf file. Just make sure there aren't any important changes in there that you that would be needed in order to reproduce the image or make sure that you're capturing that local.conf file as part of your sources. Testing. Testing is very important. Mistakes are easy to make. That's why we have tests that applies to all software and that also applies to this process of releasing your sources and license text. The gold standard for checking that you've actually captured all the source code that goes into your image is to check that the image itself can actually be replicated from the sources and the build scripts that you publish. There isn't really the same gold standard test for ensuring that you've published all the license text and copyright notices, but if you've covered everything for um, capturing the sources, then the likelihood is you're going to have covered everything for capturing the license text as well. So automate this test if possible. Um, this is something that you should be able to put into some sort of continuous integration service or put into your release scripts to try rebuilding the image from the sources that you provide and then make sure you run this test on every software release that you make. So let's talk practically about how you would actually do this using two popular build systems. So first of all for Builder, I'm not a Builder expert, but I do know that you can run make legal dash info within build root in order to produce a directory tree containing both the licenses and copyright notices as well as all the source code that is used by build root to produce your final image. So this is a little less configurable than the tools provided by Open Embedded, but it's well documented and it's really easy to use. And if you want some more info on this, there was a talk by Luca at FOSDEM 2020 last year um, titled License Compliance for Embedded Linux Devices with Buildroot. Moving on to Open Embedded and Yocto project, which is kind of the area that I work in quite a lot. We provide an archiver class that you can enable to capture the source code that Bitbake downloads as part of the build. Alternatively, you can just archive the downloads directory that Bitbake uses to cache the downloaded files in, but this is a little less flexible and might need some manual post-processing if you go that way. The archiver is definitely much more featureful and useful way of doing this. You should also be capturing the licenses directory that is produced by Bitbake, or you could enable installation of the license text into the target image itself. All of this is covered in Yocto project documentation, and it's also covered by a couple of previous talks that I've done. So there's two listed here um, with similar titles. I presented a talk called License Compliance in Embedded Linux with the Yocto project at ELCE in Lyon in France in 2019. And I presented a talk called Open Source License Compliance with Yocto project at Linaro Connect 2020.
And there is some overlap between those talks, but there is also some material that's unique to each talk. So I'd recommend giving both of those a look if you're after more information. So I wanted to give you some links to other projects which you might find relevant in the area of open source license compliance. The reuse project is about providing license metadata within a project in a consistent and machine passable format. The Open Chain project aims to address what happens when you're building and releasing a software image that also incorporates some open source release from one or more vendors and your ability to provide license compliance is really dependent on whether your vendors have done their license compliance job properly. So that's definitely one that's worth checking out if you're in that situation. OSS Review Toolkit can help you to go through each of the software packages within your image and review the license compliance status of these. The Software Heritage Project is focused on being a permanent archive for own source software source code. And lastly, Fossology is a tool for, again, looking at each of the packages that are involved in a software release and allowing you to review the license conditions and check that you've got accurate licensing data for all of those. So let's finish up by talking about the open work that needs to be done in these areas. I'd like to see a review of the status of license compliance tools within some of the other embedded Linux build systems, so OpenWRT, PTXDist, probably others that I don't know the names of, um, and if there are gaps within the license compliance tools within these distros, then yeah, there's definitely some work to be done there to fill those gaps. I'd also like to see some improvements in the state for language-specific package managers. A lot of these are really not built around the idea of reproducibility or of being able to archive the source code that goes into a build for later use and for license compliance. And we've also got some more work to do to integrate the various embedded Linux build systems with some of the other projects and tools that were mentioned on the previous slide. So that's everything that I wanted to cover today done. Um, if you're watching this live, we've now got some time for Q&A. If you're watching this back after Fosdem is finished, then I welcome any questions by email or on Twitter or anywhere else that you can find me. Cheers.